Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 209, Ludwig Niedhart, God and Time, A Defense of God's Timelessness. Dr. Ludwig Niethardt teaches philosophy at the University of Augsburg in Bavaria, Germany. He's written on such subjects as apologetics, philosophy of space and time, philosophy of science, and natural theology. In this talk from the 2017 conference in Bonn, Germany, Dr. Niethardt takes a traditional Catholic position about God and time, that God is timeless, that God is not at all in our time. But his arguments are not exactly traditional. Along the way, he invokes parallel universes and the matrix. He argues boldly, and I think you'll find this talk very interesting, and interesting to contrast with the second one in this series, episode 207 by Dr. Ryan Mullins. Mullins defends the view that God is in time, and in this episode, Dr. Niethardt defends the traditionally more popular view that God is timeless. So, which side, in your view, has the stronger arguments? Dr. Niedart will not only outline a position, but he will give about four arguments for it, some of which he admits are stronger arguments than others. On the blog post for this episode, there are links where you can get this paper by Dr. Niedart and where you can find out about his other work and some other things that he mentions along the way. So without further ado, Dr. Niedart. First of all, I want to remark that the subject of our conference here, God and Time, in my opinion, exceeds human understanding, proper understanding. Nobody, I think, knows for real or for sure if uh, God is timeless or outside time. Because uh, God is a very difficult topic. Who can understand God? Who can comprehend God? And time is also uh, one of the most difficult uh, topics in philosophy, as we all know. And so the relation between God and time may be one of the most difficult topics in philosophy. And therefore, I decided what to do. Maybe it's more sure to stick with the tradition. And so I tried to find arguments to defend God's timelessness, which is a traditional view. But knowing that maybe also tradition may be false in the last analysis. But I, I found uh, real interesting arguments, modern arguments uh, with the logic uh, of modern logic. And uh, so I want uh, to make this case as clear as possible how you will come to the timeless God. I start, of course, with the introduction. Eternalism, as the term, the term is used here in my talk, refers to the classical doctrine that God is timeless. That means outside the timeline in which we live. Whether God has is, is in its own time, this is uh, another subject. I don't deal with this. In this precise uh, sense, I, I um, define eternalism outside of our timeline. The other view is I call temporalism, meaning God is within our timeline. And temporalism has two main branches. Process theology, which is the older one, maintains that God is in time and that he is developing himself. He is increasing his perfection. And uh, this is a very radical view. Another branch of temporalism is open theism. And open theism maintains that God is not increasing his perfection, but he is moving horizontally through time. He's always on the, on the top of perfection, and but he doesn't know the future, and so he has to wait what will happen as we are waiting. There are also some middle positions, we heard it in the, in the last talk. I want uh, especially to point to William Craig, who says that God was timeless before creation and then he jumped into time. And uh, in contradistinction to open theism, Craig holds that God knows the future in advance, but he experiences time. He knows it every, at every point of time how late it is now, 
And this is changing. This is the only thing that changes for God. This is a very mitigating, uh, mitigated temporalism, in my view. In my view, there is no middle position. Either God is in time or, or not. I want to present these two views with a picture. This is the picture for temporal God. The straight line is the timeline. And God is like a ball rolling here in this um, direction from past to future. The corresponding picture for eternal God is that God is pushed away from the timeline. It's, it's, it's not on the timeline. And I, I want to correct this uh, picture a little bit by uh, replacing this straight line by a half circle in order to show that this means that God, from this, his position outside time, is um, equally, uh, the distance from God to the, to the time is equal to each point of time. So he can, with equal ease, he can perceive and act upon every point of time. So, now I come to the main point, how to defend the timeless God. We must, of course, start with the concept of God in order to settle this question. A suitable concept seems to be the concept of God in the so-called perfect being theology, according to which God is the most perfect being conceivable. This conception is accepted by most theists, including many temporalists, at least. The patron saint of this view is St. Anselm of Canterbury, whose famous definition of God reads, God is a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. It seems that this concept can also be connected somehow to the biblical revelation of the name of God, Yahweh, which means, at least in the simplest rendering of the word, he is. And one can interpret this to mean he is poor, illimited being. This is at least the way the medievals uh, analyze this, uh, this name. So what does it mean? What is greatness here? And, of course, we have here to consider the levels of being or ranks of reality. The lowest rank is occupied by the so-called impossible entities that can't exist in the proper sense, such as uh, square circles or wooden irons. And the subsequent rank is that of mere possible entities, such as flying horses or golden mountains, that do not exist in actuality, but could have been actualized. And this is more than just being impossible. And then above this level follows the rank of contingent actual act entities that do actually exist, but could also have failed to have actual existence. And these entities can be ordered by the increasing independence, beginning with the accidents, which are properties, and not able to exist alone, and then follows the well-known series of minerals, plants, animals, and humans, over which the theologians pose the angels. And the highest conceivable rank of this hierarchy, one has to put God. And God then must be a necessary entity, because necessity is the extreme contrary of impossibility, which is a characteristic mark of the lowest rank. Now, it seems difficult to reconcile necessity with temporality, because all clear examples of necessary beings known to us, such as platonic ideas or eternal truths, are timeless. And therefore, the necessity of God, which follows from the definition, could if be at least the first hint that he probably is outside of time. That is not proof yet, but it is a, a hint. The just considered levels of reality invite us to take a short look on the so-called ontological argument for God's existence, which I want to present very shortly in a most compelling form, essentially based on ideas of Leibniz. For every entity, or rather for every idea of an entity, there are three possible options, Leibniz says. The first is that the idea is necessary, which means that uh, the entity exists in every possible world. Or the idea is contingent, me meaning that the entity exists in some, but not in all worlds. Here the 
circles represent the possible worlds. The bold circle is the actual world in, in which we live, and the cross um, is the symbol that the entity is within this world is present. And the third possibility is uh, the idea is impossible, the third option rather, is that it is uh, impossible, which means that the entity exists in no possible world. I think that is uh, logically very clear. Now, the classical conception of God, given that God is necessary, this sets the definition, then the second option here must be discarded by definition. So, only the first option, according to which God is necessary, just as the definition says, only the first option or the third option remains. The third option would be the right one here if the concept of God is in the last analysis contradictory. Leibniz has expressed his, this insight by his famous assertion, if God is possible, that means if the third option is also wrong, then he actually exists, because then the first option is the, real, the right one and then he exists. So Leibniz has only to show that, this, that the third option is, only, is also wrong, and uh, uh, he does this by pointing out that there can be no contradiction between mere positive attributes. Because God, we say God um, is, a, is a mere positive entity, so in this conception there is no contradiction. At least for Leibniz this is, uh, this is clear. So, and uh, then, therefore, God exists. Of course, one can make several objections to this proof, and the same holds also for the other so-called proofs of God's existence. They do not convince everyone. It is not my aim here uh, to discuss the, at length this, the pros and cons of the ontological arguments or other arguments. In any case, it seems that all classical arguments for God's existence are very interesting ways, in my opinion, ways of thought that might at least fortify the conviction that our belief in God is a reasonable one. What I want to point out is that almost all famous proponents of classical proofs of God's existence, here are some examples, are strong eternalists. Have been strong. There are some exceptions. For example, Craig is also has proposed a cosmological argument and is a temporalist, or um, Charles Hartshorn is even a process theologian, with um, he supports uh, proofs for existence. But um, I think this is this proofs, if we compare the proofs of Craig and Hartshorn with the other, then they are not so far reaching. For example, Craig at the end says he does not know whether his God is uh, omnipotent or, uh, or whether he is uh, omniscient and so on. I, I think that uh, the strong proofs are always connected with, uh, with eternalism in some. It seems that uh, the um, rational foundation for a temporal God is not so strong or can not so strong be defended as a rational foundation for the eternal God. And this would be, of course, uh, bad news for the temporalists, if this is true. When the Trinity's podcast returns, an objection to perfect being theology and arguments that God must be simple, changeless, and timeless. In order to prove that God has a certain attribute, one has only to show that this attribute expresses absolute perfection. So here I must address the objection that individual judgments concerning perfection are arbitrary. In reply, uh, there seems to be at least some undisputed ontological intuitions about perfection. Consider the following examples. Impossible, contingent, necessary. We had this before. Perishable, imperishable, lifeless, alive, unconscious, conscious, self-conscious, which I 
equate with personal. I think most of us would agree that in each row here, the last adjective expresses the perfection and the first the imperfection. Consider some further examples, ignorant, knowing, omniscient, impotent, potent, omnipotent, malevolent, benevolent, omnibenevolent. I think here also the third one is um, immediately the, is the perfection and can be seen as perfection. So the, the uh, last th uh, three examples leads us to the result that the God of perfect being theology must be omnibenevolent, omnipotent and omniscient. The uh, omnipotence leads us to the result that there can be only one God, at most one God. Because um, suppose there are two independently acting gods, being omnipotent, both, then obviously we get a contradiction because each god should be able to overpower the other. So th this is impossible unless we say that the two gods are not acting independently but are in some mysterious way naturally united, disposing over one and the same supreme power source. But then it seems to be more appropriate to speak about one and the same God occurring in different persons, similar to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Next, we need to reflect, of, it's very important for, for my argument, about simplicity of God. There are, of course, notions of simplicity in classical theology in which all properties of God are identical, it is said, and identical with each other and with the essence of God. Such a radical notion of simplicity might be too strong, and anyway, for our purpose, we don't need it. What we need is a statement that there might be a variety, even a, an infinity of different perfections that come together in God and concentrate themselves in a point-like, non-extended divine essence. To see that simplicity in this sense is a perfection, suppose that you have a perfectly equipped office. <laughs> where you can do whatever you might want to do in an office, but for each task you want to do, you have a different device for writing a typewriter, for calculation, a pocket calculator. If you wish to know what time is it, you have a clock on the wall and so on. And wouldn't it be more perfect if you had only one single device with which you can do everything? Of course <laughs> it would. And the reason seems to be that although the office might be perfect, considered as a whole, it is not perfect considered its parts. Because each part, that is each device, isn't most perfect because it is limited in its, its abilities. So if an entity has parts, then in order to be the most perfect entity, all the parts must be most perfect. But then the multitude of parts is superfluous for each part would already have all conceivable perfections. And therefore, the most perfect entity should be simple, unextended entity. Also, there is another consideration that leads to the same result. In order to increase perfection in technology, we proceed in two directions. In the first place, we try to extend the power and abilities of the device. But in the second place, there is also the well-known process of miniaturization. We try to concentrate the highest power in a space as small as possible. The reason for this seems to be not only that it is uh, more practical to have a small device, but also an entity is that is big and has equal power than an, an entity that is small. Of these two entities, the small one is more admirable. Therefore, again, the most perfect thing conceivable seems to be a point-like entity having infinitely great power. A corollary of this result is, by the way, that God cannot be a corporal body because a corporal body cannot be unextended. On the other hand, it seems that to be omnipresent everywhere in space, in time, is also a perfection. And we can ask, how can this be reconciled then with the property of being unextended? To this we can reply that for a non-corporal and spiritual entity, Presence can be suitably defined in terms of cognition and action. A spiritual entity is cognitively present at some point of space-time if it can immediately perceive this point. And it is causally present in a, a certain point 
if it can immediately act there. And therefore, the statement that God is omnipresent means simply that he can perceive and act upon everything. And this can be inferred straightforwardly from his omniscience and omnipotence. The overall picture of God we should now have in mind is that God resembles a point from which different rays go out and connect God with all points of the universe, symbolizing God's perceptions and actions at all locations. Cognition and, and consolative of God extends to everything, but God is, is not extended, but a point. This applies, of course, not only to space, but to time as well. So God is a point that can act and perceive everything on the timeline. So this resembles the picture I um, presented previously. Also, this picture might suggest already that God is outside space and time. It is not yet made clear by the preceding considerations. Because one could suggest that God might be a point within space-time, connected with all other points. However, we shall see in the following consideration why, why this is not possible. In order to do so, we must see what is eternity. We must ask what is eternity. Now, I start with the definition of Boethius. Eternity is simultaneous, perfect possession of illimitable life. Here, the first adjective, illimitable, postulates that God's existence extends through every point of time. The second one, simultaneous, indicates that uh, all expressions of life that is acting and perceiving is performed all at once, without change or succession. And the third adjective here is uh, perfect, but I think, in my opinion, this adjective is misplaced here because it refers to possession, and I cannot do something. I, I propose to shift this adjective to the life, so that is my definition of eternity, simultaneous possession of illimitable and perfect life. Makes more sense. We will we'll see why. Now, first we can ask whether God has this property to be eternal in this sense. And this is very easy to show. First, God is omnipresent, as we saw, and uh, from the omnipresence it follows that he exists at every time without beginning and end. This is the illimitability. The second point, simplicity, or um, from the simplicity is, it follows immutability, because immutability is only the temporal aspect of simplicity. And then the, it follows that God lives his life non-successively but simultaneously, so we have deduced the second uh, um, property here. And from omniscience and omnipotence, it follows that God perceives and acts on everything at all times in perfect way. So we have perfection. And so we can say God, the God of perfect being theology must be eternal in this sense. But now I could ask whether this means that God is timeless. That is not clear. Is it possible that a, a temporal being has these properties, we must ask. And uh, if not, why not? Now, I think the first point, illimitable, is possible for a temporal being. Just consider a stone lying around eternity to eternity, so is it, it's illimitable. But it's in time, of course. The second, illimitable, if we add simultaneous life, I think it is also possible for a temporal being. Simultaneous means that all his acting is not changing. So the stone lying, lying around doing nothing has, of course, simultaneously illimitable life. This is possible for a, pos for a temporal being. So, simultaneity is also possible. And this does not ex exclude this simultaneity, a temporal succession of different relations between the entity and the outside world, which are caused by real changes of the outside world alone. So, I, I think simultaneous um, means only that it is internally unchangeable. Consider as um, an example a sun that is shining from eternity to eternity and doing nothing else, and the planet moving around, then the sun has different relations to the planet, but the uh, uh, reason for this is that the planet is moving, not the sun. So this sun, in my definition, would have illimitable simultaneous life and be in time. So, if we must push God outside the timeline, it can be all, only the third property of eternity. 
And the third property was that it has perfect life, illimitable, simultaneous, and perfect life, was my definition. So why is this not possible for a temporal entity? I think here, consider the timeline. To have perfect life means to perceive all, everything, and to act on everything. And now I think it is clear that, it seems uh, to be clear, that we can act only to the future and can perceive only the past. So an entity what can act upon every point in the timeline, if the entity is temporal, it must be located at the beginning of time, here. Only here it is possible to act on the whole timeline. But to perceive the whole timeline is only possible here. At the end of time, you can perceive the past. <laughs> to have both is not possible. So if there is an entity that can do both, that can perceive everything and act upon it, must be outside the timeline. This is the reason, I think, because uh, God uh, has to be pushed outside from time. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Niedart examines a view about how God and the cosmos are related and in his view, they're related somewhat as a mind is related to its ideas or experiences. He even goes so far as to bring in the Matrix. One could ask now, how is it even conceivable that an entity here outside of time could act upon and perceive the world? This question concerns the relation between God and the world, between a timeless God and the world. And concerning this relation in general, there seem to be only three possibilities. The first is that God is a physical part of the world. This is, of course, uh, then it must be in time. The second possibility is that the other way around, that the word is a, a physical part of God. But apparently neither the first nor the second proposal seems to be an acceptable option, because in both cases, God and the universe would be parts of one and the same greater spatio-temporal frame of reference. The only third possibility known to me is uh, the, the proposal that the word is not a physical part of God, but an idea in the divine mind. And this would mean the word is no physical sub substantial part of God, but a mental part, so, so to speak. But then the relation between God and the word is a special kind of parallel universe relation. By this I mean I, a kind of separation which is neither spatial nor temporal. One cannot travel from one universe to another parallel universe by moving through space or time. Examples for these uh, parallel universes are two dream worlds. I cannot travel in my dream world and appear in yours. Or two emulated uh, universes, virtual computer-generated realities. Or two real universes as proposed in quantum mechanics in, in some interpretations. One can probably explain this suitably by using the idea of the emulated universes. This idea is, is illustrated in such films as Matrix or The Thirteenth Floor, my favorite film, where computer programmers have created a, an emulated word and the people in the program word think that their word is a real one. They develop a kind of self-consciousness and act independently of the program guided by their own free will. Moreover, the programmer by putting some device on his head, can enter in the computer world and act immediately with the people therein. Well, I don't think that, uh, in fact, humans are able to create such emulated realities in the computer, but it seems to me that God can and has done something like that. Now, the relation between two emulated universes is the relation of parallel universes, 
But the relation between one emulated universe and the real world of the computer programmer is also a relation of parallel universes, although in this case the two universes are not on the same footing as the universe of the programmer has a privileged mode of reality. In an exactly analogous way, I see the relation between God and our world, our universe he has created. And if this is the correct description, then of course God is outside of our space-time, just as the programmer is outside of the computer world, completely outside, and yet he is the creator and supervisor of this world. Possibly he can also somehow enter in the game, as uh, in, this, in, the, in the film, the third floor, and act with us here. And this would be an explanation for the doctrine of incarnation. So here my main argument ends. Before I proceed to additional arguments, I would like to remark, uh, one should not confound the notion of parallel universes with the notion of possible words mentioned before. The difference is that two parallel universes here are supposed to coexist both in a full actualized state in one and the same possible world, while two possible worlds cannot coexist in, don't coexist in actuality. Man can, tra man can travel, maybe one can travel from one parallel universe into the other, but one cannot travel from one possible world into the other. Here I disagree with David Lewis, by the way, who confounds the two concepts and says possible worlds are in fact parallel universes. Now I come to some short additional arguments for divine timelessness. The first is the flow of time. Up to now we discussed God and his absolute perfection and argued that this seems to force us to put him, push him outside from time. Now we will look in the opposite direction. We look down to time and discover the imperfection of temporality. Thereby we get a second argument to push, put God outside of time again. I want to show this in a kind of ontological meditation by explaining a symbolic picture I personally have for the flow of time. I compare the temporal entity with a surfer on a surfboard serving on the waves of the ocean. Yeah. The water in front of the surfer symbolizes the future and the waters behind her or him the past, while the point of contact with the ocean, the wave, is the present. The height of the water level symbolizes the intensity or grade of reality as it appears to the surfer. Now, the level of the distant future here is very low, but I emphasize it is not equal to zero, that is, the future is not totally unreal. This is because the future is doing something, namely, it approaches us. And if it is doing something, it must also be something real. And if the future is very near to us, say, tomorrow, then it suddenly increases its uh, level of reality because it throws already its shadow upon us and urges us to prepare for its coming. And if it finally reaches us at the peak of full reality, then at the same moment it begins to fade down but remains forever at the higher level in the, of, um, in the distant past. It's a higher level of reality than the distant future. This is because we can see the past, we can explore the past, and the past also uh, remains with us with, in its effects. So, in short, we have full contact only with the present, less with the past, even less with the, with the future. And now the question arises, can God be described as such a surfer with such a restricted contact to reality? Of course not, I think. God must be either the whole ocean of reality and if this is too pantheistic, we can say he is the ground of the ocean, having all reality completely in his hand. While the preceding two arguments, so these are, I think, two good arguments for God's timelessness. And these uh, two arguments have been very strong one, in my opinion. The following two are not so strong, but uh, they are used uh, several times and therefore I want to, to mention them also. The third argument is as follows. Time must have 
or at least at least does have, or at le very least it could have a beginning. Whereas God, so runs the argument, cannot have a beginning because of its immensity. Thus, okay, I am not so sure what follows from this. Uh, if if uh, logically it would follow that God cannot be essentially in time, that it must uh, be. Um, if time could have only a beginning, then that means it is a possible world where time has a beginning, and in this possible world, God cannot be in time. That is a very weak uh, um, conclusion, so I don't like it. <laughs> One could say in our world, uh, God is in time. But on the other hand, I could say, uh, according to cosmologists, the current... Uh, theories, uh, our, our universe had a beginning in time, and if this is true, then uh, God must exceed somehow this timely universe. Uh, similar arguments, uh, for example, of Brian Leftow, he makes a great deal of this, rely on the relativity theory. I uh, have also dealt with this um, in extent in my book, but I, I would say that uh, um, I would avoid this uh, whole discussion, because at the end, it seems to me that simply relativity theory does not apply to God. It is all the feature of our corporal universe, and so we cannot base an argument for God's uh, relation to time. So I would dismiss this argument, but I would uh, wanted to mention it. And the last argument is a biblical one. God's being outside of time is the best explanation, one says, for his comprehensive foreknowledge of the future events testified by the Bible. Of course, there are in the Bible we find some astonishing predictions of God. Think, for example, Jesus said uh, in advance that Peter will deny him three times the next morning, and this was this he could not know as a temporal being. One could say, but I would say this argument is also not very convincing because we have here two difficulties. The first is the difficulty if we are based on the Bible. Many Bible verses support also temporalism, as we saw. So it is, I think um, this is, is a, a complicated matter to be solved by the exegetes. And also this argument must face the problem of freedom and for knowledge, which, which is a very complicated um, matter. So I, I have dealt with this at length in my book, but I would here propose to throw this uh, argument in the waste paper basket for a moment so we can <laughs> proceed. And at my last point are some remarks to the arguments for God's temporality. I think there are three kinds of, ta of arguments for temporal God. The first is biblical. The second are logical arguments based on nature of time. And the last uh, ones are based on properties of God. The biblical argument, the Bible frequently talks about God as if he is in time. In a short reply that Bible talks anthropomorphically about God as if he has a human body and as if he is in space as well. And if we take literally the, the verses that puts him, seem to put him in time, I think it's very hard to, to, uh, to see why we should not take uh, literally also the other, the other uh, aspects that he is in, in space as well. So, uh, for example, in Genesis 3, we read, And they, uh, Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? If we take this literary, then uh, God, he does not know the present, not only the future, not to speak of the future, but he does not know all, everything that is in, in, takes place in present. Furthermore, he, he uh, walks around, so he must have a body and so on, and must be in space. The second arguments based on nature of time are very funny. Woltersdorf says, at, it's, uh, two arguments of this sort, a timeless God does not exist at any time, which is true, so he doesn't exist. Point. Full stop. Or Swinburne says, a timeless God would exist simultaneously with, each, uh, with all events in time, therefore all events in time would exist simultaneously, which is nonsense. 
such uh, arguments, of course, can be easily rejected. Reply to, to Waterstorff, this presupposes that to exist means to exist in time. And this begs the question, of course. Short reply to B, here we have an equivocation of simultaneity because the kind of simultaneity that God has to all events is not the same kind that the events have to each other. Um, you can read here uh, <coughs> Stump and Cashman, for example. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Niedart answers certain arguments from divine attributes to the conclusion that God is in time. Last arguments for temporal God are based on properties of God, namely his personality, memory, anticipation, decision implies being in time. Another is uh, God's interaction with creatures, presupposing presuppose being in time. And the last is God's omniscience, the timeless God doesn't know how late is it. it is. Now to this argument, <laughs> the personality, here we, one can say that uh, it seems that while human personality which involves memory, anticipation, decision, and so on, indeed presupposes temporality. But God meets these requirements, according to traditional theology, in a higher analogous sense. For example, memory and anticipation can be replaced in God just by his omniscience, because memory means I know the past and anticipation, I know the future, or I... I think to know the future, and God knows both simply because he is omniscient. So uh, he has, uh, has this in a higher sense. So he is, he is a person in a higher sense, one can reply in short. The interaction argument also can be rejected by saying that God simultaneously perceives and acts, and thereby also reacts to the whole of human and cosmic history. He perceives all at once, and he can react all at once. And this does not discard the structure of a dialogue, say. I say something to God, God answers to me. One thinks that this presupposes time, but what it presupposes is only a structure of logical dependence. The reason for the answer of God must be that I have asked him something. And this can be simultaneously. It suffices that we have this logical dependence, I think. So, I come to an additional point to this uh, interaction um, problem. Yeah, at this point, temporalists may insist that to assume a temporal God who doesn't know the future has the advantage that, first, it is easier to understand how human freedom can be preserved, and it is easier to solve the problem of theodicy, the problem of how it is possible that the evil and suffering is within the world. So, I would say, in short, to this argument of the freedom, I agree it is, it is easier to understand if God would not know the future. But I say it, um, the, the truth must not be easy to understand. I refer here to my book. <laughs> I don't want to... <laughs> but uh, the, the second problem, I completely disagree that the problem of theosophy is easier to handle with. I want to demonstrate this by following consideration. Consider a temporal God who doesn't know the future, but has comprehensive knowledge of the present, as most temporalists concede, at least the open theist. Then suppose that God has seen in the 1914s the Auschwitz concentration camp here, and that it has built, and say yesterday and the day before, hundreds of people have been gassed in the gas chambers. Suppose further that now God sees again a train full of Jewish captives approaching the camp. In this case, he must not be omniscient in order to know what is going to happen now if nothing interferes. 
And so the temporalist has no less problem here than the eternalist. And I would even say that, in fact, the temporalist has much a greater problem. The god of eternalism knows in advance the whole extent of evil to come. So he knows also that the evil will not surpass a certain boundary, which we don't, don't know, but God must know. And that at the end, the evil will not prevail. All this he knows. And therefore, he can calm down, sit down on his throne, knowing everything will be right at the end. On the other hand, consider the temporal God, precisely because he doesn't know all this, he has to fear that perhaps all will be totally corrupted and evil may not be compensated, never. And therefore, he would have a very strong reason to interfere. In short, the more God resembles ourselves, being in time just like us, the more he must also act like we would. And we, of course, would have interfered in the Auschwitz case. So it seems that the only promising way to solve the problem of the Odyssey is the option that God is not as we are, that he transcends our temporarily restricted point of view, having other insights from an exalted standpoint over space and time, and therefore might see things and have reasons beyond our comprehension. And so in the end, it turns out that a deeper reflection of the problem of theodicy provides much more support for eternalism than for temporalism. So the last point is God's omniscience that uh, implies temporality because God doesn't know how late it is, it is the timeless God. This runs as follows. A timeless God is like a writer of a theater play who is absent from the performance. So while he knows perfectly the sequence of events that will come, he doesn't know which act is being played right now. This seems to be a severe kind of ignorance. My reply to this is following. Temporal and likewise spatial or personal indexical words such as now, here, and I refer to the spatio-temporal location and to the personal in identification of the speaker. Therefore, questions related to these indexicals like how late is it, where are you, who are you, and so on, have to be answered from the perspective of the speaker anyway. The eternal God could answer, it is now every time, or it is now eternity. The temporal God would, would say, it is now Tuesday, I don't know. This is the same. So God's omniscience refers to his complete knowledge of universally accessible facts, not of the indexical facts. In addition to the knowledge of all such facts, every observer has also knowledge of indexical facts that refer essentially to him in his own pers perspective. Facts that differ from every observer. Therefore, by putting God in time, one would not really increase uh, his knowledge. So it seems inappropriate to claim that God must be in time in order to be omniscient. Yet, the core of this problem is that God is in his, in his divine nature doesn't share with us the same temporal perspective. And that is a real problem for the believer. He wants a God that is with him. But this, I think, is no problem to be solved by the philosophers, by changing the philosophic philosophical view of God, but can be solved by theology. This is a problem, and a theological solution for this is, of course, the doctrine of incarnation. God, in addition to his eternal, divine, timeless nature, assumes a second created nature and thus comes into time. So this would solve this problem. Thank you. This week's Thinking Music has been the track The True Entity of Life by Daniel Birch and Ben Pigley. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to or download that entire track. I want to reiterate my thanks to Dr. Ryan Mullins for bringing us the audio from the Bond Conference. 
and to the Society for the Philosophy of Time for putting it on, and also to the Templeton Foundation, which helped to make it possible. And before we go, I wanted to send my sincerest thanks to Lisa in Virginia for her generous donation through PayPal. Thank you very much, Lisa. I hope the podcast has been and continues to be helpful to you. If you'd like to support the podcast with a monthly or one-time donation, you can do that by PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right of any blog post. And also, you can use Patreon or Patreon if you'd like to donate on a per-episode basis. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>